Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm Lisa Costello and I'm the gallery director. Um, we're really happy to be here at the William Starkle Planetarium this afternoon. Uh, welcome to all of our online attendees for attending uh, as well. I want to uh, thank our donors for their tremendous support. And I'd also like to thank the Gertz Gallery Advisory Board. Some of them are out here. Uh, the Parkman College Administration, Donna Gertz, for whom the gallery is named, and her husband, Fred. And we also appreciate the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency, for their continued support that we receive through grant funding. It also allows us to do event like, events like these that are free and open to the public. I'd also like to thank Paula McCarty, who's out here in the audience, uh, for her help as the exhibitions coordinator. She's magnificent. I couldn't do it without her help. Uh, finally, yeah, applause. Uh, uh, finally, I'd like to thank the William Starkle Planetarium for hosting us. It's such a magical, magical place to have an event. Uh, this uh, this afternoon, we have Wayne McCauley, who is uh, the planetarium producer, helping us with technology, and Eric Johnson, the planetarium director, for his assistance. So thank you, everybody, for being here, and thank you, everyone, for helping us with this event. Gertz Gallery serves as a platform to exhibit contemporary art. In addition, we are a learning laboratory for our students. It is critical we exhibit and host programming that features professional artists so that so that faculty can use the gallery as an instructional resource and our students in the community can experience the artwork in person and hear artists speak about their process, their career, and their artistic journey. The current exhibition in Blackest Shade and Darkest Light accomplishes our goals. This exhibit, curated by UIUC Associate Professor and Chair of Studio Arts, Patrick Earl Hammy, um, features seven nationally recognized artists, including Hammy, and is open through Saturday, February 18th of next year. We, have, uh, we had a wonderful reception a couple of weeks ago with music by participating artist and DJ Stacey Robinson, uh, who is also an associate professor in the art design department at UIUC. This exhibition centers around drawing that is non-traditional and innovative in its use of media, process, and subject matter. In addition to Patrick and Stacy, participating artists include Kumasi J. Barnett, William Downs, Kenyatta Forbes, Robert Pruitt, and Charles Edward Williams. If you haven't already, I hope you're able to visit the exhibition. Um, the show's title takes inspiration from DC Green Lantern's core oath, in brightest day, in blackest light, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power, Green Lantern's light. Uh, in curating the show, Patrick states, and I quote, the artists in this exhibition revel in horror, Afrofuturism, magical realism, ethnogothic, fantasy, black quantum futurism, utopias and dystopias, and superheroes. So if you haven't been able to go see the show, I hope that you're able to do so soon. Um, this is our last programming until we close for the holiday break on December 12th. However, we will continue new exhibition-related programming next semester once we reopen on January 9th. These events will be announced uh, as those dates and, and are set and will be posted on our website. A side note I wanted to mention is that another exhibition in our community is concurrent with our In Blackest Shade and Darkest Light exhibition, and that's at Craner Art Museum. That features Black faculty in the School of Art and Design, and it's titled Black on Black on Black on Black. This exhibition is on view until December 10th, and it's a terrific show. Um, it's amazing to see Patrick's work and all the other artists' work in that um, exhibition space. And it includes artwork by Patrick Earl Hammy and Stacey Robinson, along with two other artists who are in the art design faculty. One of us here, Nikita. Hello, Nikita. Um, uh, today, as we are honored to have Patrick Earl Hammy here with us to speak about his artwork in the exhibition, um, he'll also be speaking about some of his earlier work. He is a visual artist and educator specializing in portraiture, storytelling, and the body and visual culture. He examines personal and shared Black experiences and offers stories that expand our understanding of others. Hammy was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and now lives here in Champaign, where he's an associate professor and chair of studio arts at the University of Illinois. Hammy's work has been exhibited in Germany, India, South Africa, and the United States at venues that include um, the California African American Museum, the Drawing Center, 
John Michael Kohler Art Center, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, Bo Bartlett Center, and the Zhao B. Art Center. He was an artist in residence at the John Michael Kohler Art Center and a recipient of the Alice C. Cole 1942 Fellowship from Wellesley College. Uh, his works are included in public and private collections, including the David C. Driscoll Center, Kinsey Institute Collection, Kohler Company Collection, J.P. Morgan Chase Art Collection, and William Benton Museum of Art. He has been supported by fellowships and grants from the Mellon Foundation, Joyce Foundation, Midwestern Voices and Visions, Huffin Foundation, Tan Foundation, and the State of Illinois and Connecticut, as well as in private foundations. In addition to Patrick speaking, we are joined this afternoon by Dr. Nicole Anderson Cobb. She will be in conversation with Patrick after his presentation um, and before our Q&A. Uh, we're delighted to have her join us. And, and Nicole Anderson Cobb is a historian, playwright, and researcher. She deploys theater to examine American institutions, how people of color have navigated these spaces historically and in our current times, and the role of faith and religious practice in these negotiations. By examining institutions at crossroads in the 21st century, Anderson Cobb has written on topics as varied as anti-Muslim hate crimes on college campuses, an award-winning play about a family of African-American funeral home directors battling gun violence, the non-denominational church and the January 6th insurrection, American museum cultures, early 20th century art collectives in Charleston, South Carolina, African-American sororities, Gun violence in American cities and American school and American schooling and police community relations. These projects have garnered attention from local, regional, and national media outlets. Um, there are too many to mention, but they include the Chicago Defender, the Reader in Chicago, the Chicago Sun Times, the Daily Illini here in Champaign, uh, the News Gazette, the Lutheran Magazine, or Harriet celebrating the fullness of Black womanhood. The Salt Collective, which is a national blog. Smile Politely, she was recently interviewed in, I think today it came out. Is that right, Jess? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, among other publications. Uh, Anderson Cobb was a 2020 Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting Coronavirus News Collaboration Challenge grantee, where she conducted research on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Central Illinois Museums. She was also awarded a residency earlier this year as a Coolidge Fellow in the April Auburn Seminary Colloquium in, the, in New York City, writing and serving as a participant in a projects related to Beyond Land Acknowledgement that she created in partnership with Latrell Bright during an artist in residence at Allerton Park and the Creed Center here uh, in Monticello. Anderson Cobb is working with Bright to prepare for an additional public performance of Land, Beyond Land Acknowledgement at the Allerton Mansion and the Allerton Park and Retreat Center in April of 2023. Anderson Cobb is currently preparing for an upcoming production of her script Homegrown and Insurrection Play, showing December 2nd through the 10th of this year at Urbana Station Theater. So be sure to check that out. Uh, additionally, she is also preparing for a reading of her Black Canaries about race in the 21st century. This play was a semi-finalist for the second annual Black Motherhood and Black Parenting New Play Festival in 2022. Both of these artists are extremely busy and talented, as you can see from my introduction. Um, and I appreciate how generous they are with their time to join us today. Uh, so let's give uh, Patrick Earl Hammy and Dr. Anderson Cobb a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Arthur, Chris Gallery, really happy to be here. Thank you, Nicole, for making time today to come and talk with me and share. Uh, really excited about your work. I was thinking about you when listening to a recent uh, podcast on Spotify, Quiet Part Loud. It's one of Jordan Peele's newest projects. It's, uh, I think you'll enjoy it when you have some time. <laughs> um, and welcome. Thank you all for having me here. Really excited to be here and be able to share a little bit of my work with you. Uh, and everyone who's remote on Zoom and I'll be talking really briefly about some of my recent projects, and then Nicole and I will be in conversation, just packing and going through a few of the kind of, kind of points that maybe came up in this presentation, as well as some of the work we've been doing uh, around and in the community recently. And then, of course, we'd love to open it up for a dialogue with everybody. Some questions. So, 
The first thing that I think is going to be helpful to know about me is I'm a huge nerd. Has anybody here seen Black Lightning? Okay, one person. <laughs> but, um, some of you are probably familiar with Crest Williams. I go to Comic Con um, pretty frequently, and it's definitely before the pandemic, and had a chance to meet him. And so I'm a huge fan of black media, black speculation, uh, horror, comics, and everything else you can imagine being uh, called a nerd for. And so that's me on the left with Chris Williams. On the right is a brand fresh new piece I did just for fun over the holidays. Uh, I've been illustrating a little bit. And so that's a cover and a, a, a movie poster nobody asked for from a movie that not a lot of people have probably seen in here uh, called Black Dealer from 1972, a black exploitation film. And I just been spending time playing with vampires. Um, this is, again, just for fun uh, in between projects. So I did that. I just want to share, just give you a sense of kind of how nerdy that can get. And it'll give you an insight where we're going. So during the pandemic, uh, in this 2020 stay at home world, like many of you, I found myself needing to find joy, needing to find respite from what was everything happening in the world, the fear of just being, fear of going outside, fear of catching COVID, pre, uh, you know, pre vaccine. And in addition to, to amazing shows like Ted Lasso, that definitely helped me uh, find some. Some, some happiness through the pandemic. I found myself returning to Soul Train. Uh, have any people here seen or heard of Soul Train? A show of hands? All right, all right. So Soul Train, for the few that might not have seen it, is a, a show, a variety show, musical show from 1971 all the way to 2006, which I didn't even know that until I started like looking at it with adult eyes and how long it lasted, that really, uh, from, from the kind of safety and uh, security of one's home. Many people from different backgrounds could access Black excellence, Black imagination, Black creativity um, through Soul Train, where you would tune in every Saturday morning for the latest dances, the latest fashion, the latest music. And it was, you know, definitely pre the heavy corporatization of, of, of musical acts where you could sit on the stage with Marvin Gaye's chat, right? If you were one of the dancers, you could. Um, you know, talk to the Jackson Five, or you know, maybe uh, spend some time uh, between scenes with last night, and that was something that was so special. I, I try to imagine that happening today, and I feel like there's so many interests that you know, so many, so many legal things that uh, everyday person might not have that kind of experience unless you get some kind of backstage pass. So this is what early drawing I did, just to show like how this had direct kind of connection to. Um, the Solar Train, I have been really inspired by manga and manga aesthetics and comics, uh, so Japanese comics, manga. And so really delved in during the pandemic into all of the things that I showed you before being very about, I leaned in. A lot of these aspects, whether it be comics, horror, manga, um, that didn't, didn't touch my professional practice as readily, but the pandemic opened up that space. And so here I am leaning into using uh, strategies like uh, blacking out the pants and the shirt, uh, a lot of gray, a lot of half tones. If you see this in, in person, it's really intimate. You'll see a lot of half tones is way you gray things, and a lot of hatching, which is used in, in manga, but also you'll see in uh, 400-year-old prints and printmaking. So um, probably should have said just a little warning, trigger warning here, but other very heinous things besides the, the coronavirus was happening always, but was very prevalent and inescapable during the pandemic, uh, kind of culminating with the death and murder of George Floyd. I was sitting at home not knowing what to do and how to act, how to protest, if I could get out and protest, if it was safe for many different re uh, reasons, and not knowing what to do with all this energy and activity. And I saw this as a modern day lynching, and I had to delve in like the soul train back into its roots and try to understand this without myself to do. And so I did a lot of research, did a lot of digging, and asked myself, when did I first encounter lynching? Does anybody here remember, like just rhetorically, like in your mind, when you might have first heard about or encountered lynching as an idea? For me, it was in 1992 as a kid watching Candyman, a horror film where the titular character on the right here. Um, is an artist, a portraitist, um, who is hired to paint a portrait of a white woman. 
uh, they fall in love, and her dad, a racist dad, hires a lynch mob to kill him. And this is some of the scene where they're covering him with him in honey and then sticking bees on him just as another insult to injury. But he becomes a vengeful spirit that then becomes the lead character of the franchise. So that began to inform me and gave me more permission to lean into horror as a strategy. I started blending uh, for this first project, uh, first iteration of this project. Uh, my love of vampires and horror through the works of Richard Matheson. So some people might know I Am Legend on Will Smith, the uh, movie that came out. It's fine. It's fine. But the original story was steeped in vampirism. And in the story, the main, uh, main character, Robert Neville, uh, labors violently to maintain a status quo. Everyone in the world, almost everyone in the world, is turned to vampires. And they, he goes around trying to cure them. When that fails, um, he skulks from house to house during the daytime when the vampires are asleep. And he kills them, trying to return the world back to normal. I saw many parallels between what he was trying to struggle to do and some of the ways that in these, oh, sorry, I, I kind of skipped over with these lynching photo, uh, photographs that I showed earlier, that one photograph, many of them were made of postcards. They were takeaways. It was their version of Instagram in some ways. It was a terrible version of Instagram, but it was their version of Instagram. And they would send postcards to people and family and friends that couldn't be at the occasion, right? These were family, quote unquote, family friendly events where you would invite people, you would have barbecues, and you would do this terrible, these terrible, you know, crimes um, as, a, as vigilante mobs that were socially sanctioned but technically illegal. And I saw in reading the postcards and the way people thought about themselves as the protagonists of their own stories, laboring violently to maintain a status quo that may have already been passed by that point, and speculate in the future how they could secure safe spaces and prospects for their white children. And so the first project I did, I titled I Am Legend, and um, thought of ways of bringing together two distinct American experiences that almost felt to me like these mutual hauntings, where you have soul train here, where Black excellence is on display, Black community, Black sharing, Black creativity. Which terrified many of the people that participated in lunches, right? Just this, just the idea of what we could become, what we could achieve, was was as frightful as any scary monster in the night, and so it was a psychic fear for some white people. But these lynchers, these vigilante mobs, these descendants and inheritors of night watches and slave patrols that were the precursor to many early um, organized policing were the real life terror for many black people. And so I went in and looked at these postcards and took them and started taking uh, the, the figures, the characters, the people that perpetuate these crimes, started looping them out on the computer and turned them into silhouettes. Only from some, uh, some strategies that you might have seen in other artworks like Carol Walker's, uh, Gothic paintings that were heavily inspired at first by Gone the Wind and her relationship to the digital character and uh, the new character, Scarlet Opera. And so thinking about the Gothic led me into the Ethnogothic. Now, many of you probably have experienced the Ethnogothic through the works of Jordan Peele. I mentioned them earlier. Anybody seen Get Out? A few hands? Okay. Okay. So something that's really, really important to underline with the Ethnogothic, there's a lot of aspects to it, but it's very conscious of audience, of how, depending on what you bring in, you might be experiencing a very different thing. I remember, since most people have seen it, spoilers here, um, toward the end of the movie, just think back to when you were watching it, when uh, our lead character, Chris, liberates himself from, from the situation he's in through violence, through, through, um, through murdering uh, his former partner, <laughs> his former girlfriend in that movie. Um, and then we see the blue and red lights. And I remember sitting in that movie with a with an interracial group of people and, and in my own heart clenching up and being like, oh no, you can't end the movie 
be like this. This isn't how it's going to go, right? I knew what was going to come up if, if the police were showing up, right? And this this black man, Chris, was um, standing over a white woman who he just killed. Um, but other people who were in there in the film, I, I heard sighs of belief, like, oh, okay, order is going to be restored. The police are here. Very different experiences, very different expectations for the story, right? That's some of the element of what ethnographic can do when staying in, uh, when keeping those kind of different experiences in mind. I think about horror in the time of the horrific, like most of us are feeling right now, we're living in for various different reasons and very different different um, ways into these experiences, is more about a critical lens and spectacle. And so those silhouettes eventually evolved into really huge installations where I would paint these, these, uh, these silhouettes on the wall with light gray colors. Eventually they would evolve into almost shadow-like tones. So they felt like they were on the wall being passed onto the wall, literally. Um, as a kind of backdrop, a looming backdrop that was always there as as soul train images that were drawn with a lot of care and love were put on top. And that was my first try, my first effort to try to bring these two histories that are so correlated together. So backing up to Soul Train, it's a spectacle just as um, different but similar to uh, lynching, both didactic spaces that did educate their different audiences in being. Uh, but Soul Train for so many people was limited to being a site of just entertainment, only an access point where the black body and, and everything it was producing was there for, uh, for a very thin interpretation of enjoyment. And like we think about musicians today like Beyonce, they're full people, they're whole individuals. And when Gladys Knight is singing, Gladys Knight and the are singing, or a dancer is doing the bump, or I can see Turner having their own personal issues are, you know, up there performing and trying to make a living. They are existing in a world that is just as complicated and dynamic then as ours is today. When Beyonce performed the Super Bowl and was coming into her own in a very fresh way, not just to uh, kind of leaning into the femininity that she wanted to express, but leaning into the black she wanted to express the pop icon, a lot of people couldn't see themselves getting more reflected in her as a, as a symbol. And other people saw themselves now reflected differently and excitingly. Um, when she performed a few weeks later at the CMT Awards, Daddy Lessons, which is a country song, true and true, uh, speaking about her dad, speaking about their relationship, speaking about gun culture and in a positive way to the Second Amendment, talking about coming from the South, you can't get more country than that contemporarily. She had a cold reception by the audience. It's very complicated very complicated. So some of those are the histories and kind of things that I'm trying to bring into dialogue. This first show called I Am Legend at the Freeport Art Museum. This is also a space that had a, a, another layer of this project where I worked with the museum to create what we call the BIPOC Initiative, Black Indigenous People of Color Initiative, where we created a space and a program that would support 10 artists for five years to, to do solo exhibitions in tandem with each other and curate other, art, other artists of color into this exhibition. So the way of beginning to change the institutional system to make it more welcoming to artists, especially artists of color, to make it more welcoming to the community. And the community that Freeport occupies up in um, up toward uh, Chicago, uh, the majority of the population is black and brown, and they don't see themselves welcomed in space. So so all of that was going along at the same time I was developing this work. Any just more installation shots? And that led me eventually to this image that where I started to flip and mirror some of the kind of uh, silhouettes I was cutting out. And that, that opened up the door for me to, to see that I needed to spend more time with these figures. Uh, really briefly, uh, this opportunity was made possible by the exhibition Black on Black on Black on Black, which me, Nikita, uh, Thomas, Stacey Robinson, and Eddie Blair Smith planned with the museum and school art design for a little over a year. And it gave me the space to really delve deeper into 
these vigil answers to solve themselves as heroes. And I titled this leg of the project, I Am the Knight. So does anybody have a sense of where that comes from? Vigilante, I Am the Knight. Batman. Thank you, Batman, yes. So, so I'm the nerd, it's gonna come in to play. <laughs> so the animated series Batman from 1992, his catchphrase in the first episode was, uh, I, am I am darkness, I am vengeance, I am the knight, I am Batman. And that's a complicated relationship to a white billionaire who runs around and punches people in the in night, <laughs> right? And so I thought it was an interesting framework, a way in, similar to I Am Legend, and thinking about this vision of justice. Um, I invoked some of the aesthetics and strategies of ink blot tests. I found similar to horror, where you're watching Jaws or something similar in pre-2000, pre-screen, where a lot of the psychology is internalized because they didn't have the budget to do a lot of stuff. They didn't have the sci-fi, the CGI, where they inferred a lot. You did more of the work, and it might have been more scary than being able to see the monster. And so I felt like this was a way in. For people that came and saw I Am Legend, and some some people didn't see the silhouettes on the walls. Some people saw them and were like, oh, you're into Red Dead Redemption, the video game? That's <laughs> like, well, that's a way in. Same time period, different, different storyline. Um, or some people, you know, didn't see them until you know, longer into looking at the work, they came in, they saw Soul Train, and eventually they start backing up and say, like, what is happening around it? And then if they did do all that work and still didn't find anything maybe problematic with the silhouettes and what they pointed to, I want another to, to think through another way in. So these Rorschach-like images, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, we're a way for me to think through um, these images in a more complex way. For some, some of them, for me, I don't want to put too much on it because you might be already forming your own relationship to them. But um, I started to manifest my own visions of what these started representing. I started seeing literal types of shades of monsters and things starting to appear. And that's when I knew I had spent enough time staring in the abyss. Um, that led me to these black paintings. Um, and this one is in I am in Blackest Shade and Darkest Light at the Gertz Gallery. Uh, even with the theme of horror, I turned to Lovecraftian horror. Any Lovecraftian fans in here? All right, all right. Now, of course, the man was hyper, hyper flawed, racist, xenophobic, and everything else. Um, but uh, I felt like the way and the, the space he opened up to thinking about or from a cosmic standpoint, felt appropriate to some, so how big and how maybe terrifyingly sublime the fear and terror of, of racist intent and supremacy can be, which I was feeling again, sitting in, the, sitting in my home during the pandemic, seeing all this violence happening, feeling guilty of surviving to this age and to this level of success, knowing that I could still walk out of the door, be arrested or killed or you know, what else in prison. And you know, as a six foot one black man, still feeling a sense of fear, but fighting and, and moving through it, how it paralyzed me, I felt like I needed to wrestle with this in a, in a bigger way. So uh, these paintings and, and the, the prints earlier uh, reference places and spaces in, in, in America where these violent murders happen. And so you'll see, uh, places like Temple, Texas pop up, uh, Fayette, Missouri, um, Marietta, Georgia. And so these are just some of the places that are, that are cited. There's another one that's in the Grand Art Museum right now that points to Cairo, Illinois, just to our south, where uh, a violent murder happened in 1909. And so those opened the door and like, gave me space for this direction of the project, where I'm, I'm finally ready and have enough material to bring these two histories together in a way that I feel is, is going to be productive moving forward. This is XT X X Passionate Pain to Barbara Roy. Anybody know this band or know her? She performed on Soul Train. Um, where I'm, I'm taking images again from Soul Train, not just the celebrities, but 
you know, the everyday uh, person that was dancing, or I mean, they were professionals, but they were dancing, people who are not elevated to love the, to the realm of celebrity, and juxtaposing them in this one with some of those uh, Rorschach like, like, uh, like shapes, where if you see and think of blackness as a terrifying space, it's still there. If you see blackness, you think about it as a sense of community, a sense of hope, a sense of of belonging, a sense of, of, of aspiration and opulence is there. Um, so I'm replacing the black fields of what would be ink or paint with blackness. And then the, the, in the second direction way forward in, the, in this work is where the silhouettes are still more in whole and in, 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 intact, but how they inter, interject and loom within the painted space. Uh, as this kind of negative space of just the linen of the of the canvas, uh, how it changes the context and the relationship. It takes a scene like this, where Teddy Pendergrass and Melvin the Blue Notes are singing, uh, as something that could be, you know, a scene from again 1970s, but also almost anyone's prom, right? A scene of tenderness and of romance potentially, and just these figures, whether they're cited so specifically as Lynchers, or just the men in black with these hats, these fedoras, looming and the threat, how that changes our relationship to it. I feel like there's a real way there to engage that dialogue of what does it mean to always have this omnipresent feeling and how do you work through it and still have joy and love and life around it. And so I'll, I'll keep that, like I said, I'll keep it brief. I want to open up time for us to have more conversation. So thanks. So you saw at the beginning, there was uh, a QR code that um, takes you to a Spotify playlist with uh, nine, nine, nine our playlists that was curated for this project. So if you're looking for a place or space to continue thinking about these uh, subjects, or you just want to have something in the background while you're working and doing homework, I'll bring it back up so you can click on it and um, take it with you. In the interim, I'd love to introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Nicole Anderson Cabo to let's talk. About it. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. So good to see a really lovely crowd. You know, it's a cold day, so we thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you for the invitation, Patrick, to really talk about your work. Had an opportunity to um, see the work at the Private Art Museum, which I appreciated. Had an opportunity to spend about an hour here at the Birds Gallery on Monday. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And just kind of get to know that particular project as well. So, uh, I'll put it in voice and put it in off whatever you need to. Um, well, my question really focused on three areas um, that being the installation here at Parkland itself, mm -hmm. ask some questions about your practice as an artist, and then I have a question about the culture of installation more broadly in champaign urbana so those are kind of the three areas yeah. that i'd love to talk with you about time permitting <laughs> um the first question i had is in your opinion based on what you know i mean you're this um installation opened quite recently yes. here at parkland but i'm just curious to know what your sense is of public reception so far for this show yes um, I feel like it's been relatively positive. There's been many student groups that have come through and that's been exciting. The artists, which who are also really important in this, have felt really good about um, the reception, the way that um, they've been welcomed into the space. And myself, I've been uh, uh, I've been welcomed into Parkland as, as, a, as a community and to the Grand Gallery since 2009. I've been here 13 years. And so um, the, the larger reception, has been welcoming and this reception feels good still. <laughs> um, the other question was about the collaboration you put together, the seven artists. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be clear, some of this is about clarification for me as well, but I just want to be clear that there are that six of the seven artists are male identified artists. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna circle back to that. Please, 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 please. Yeah, no. 
in the fullness of time. But I just want to be clear on that. And also artists who come from Baltimore, from South Carolina, Atlanta, Atlanta Chicago, Chicago, Champaign. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really curious to know, what is it about the work of those artists that made Parkland the place to present and exhibit their work? Why, why these artists? Why this location and why now? Yeah. Um, so there's, I, there's multiple sides to answering all each of those questions. Um, I'm sure for some of them who were, from, who were new to Champaign or, and, or to Parkland as a site, uh, I was away in. You know, they knew me and they trusted me. And I have to respect that trust. Um, so it didn't take much selling in that regard. Like It was like, this is a fantastic space, a fantastic community. Will you be excited to share with us? And they were like, yes. And if, as you see, and as Lisa Lisa mentioned, like they're all we're all nationally recognized artists, if not some internationally recognized artists. And they're doing big things, exciting things. And and it's important that in my own practice, and in my practice and who I invite out, whether it's for exhibitions or for lectures, that the kind of hierarchies that exist um professionally, whether you know, like say say you, you don't have a BFA or for so an undergraduate degree, but you're out there doing it, that shouldn't discount your BFA. To come in, pop. or if you are, you know, going through the stratosphere and, and doing all kinds of shows around the world, it doesn't mean that like a, a community gallery is too big for you. Like this is that's important to me. It's important to who showed up. So that's first and foremost. Um, I'm trying to have a second question. <laughs> well, it was it was why these individuals, why this location, why now? Yeah. So this location now, um, and this kind of ties into your reception question, is in continuing an ongoing evolution and good energy and collaboration, which that, that was started with uh, Anna Lutheran Outlaw, who uh, was a professor here, who's now at the University of North Carolina, uh, black dancer, ballerina, uh, former um, soloist at Dancer in Harlem who began a lot of projects that brought black and brown knowledge and creativity to the fore, especially starting with the U of I and the campus and the professors and, and culture and community students there. And uh, when she moved on, the museum and the school picked up that energy and invited four of uh, the artists wearing black and black and black and black to, um, to have a platform to exhibit. Now, all of us also are very, you know, nationally oriented and we do a lot of work here, but also other places. Um, it was an opportunity to share with who we love and care about here, but also to create more welcoming space within the art museum of the Prayer, and to build stronger and bigger bridges with in the larger community at large and with this exhibition, with these conversations, a more uh, collaborative and connective tissue with part between the two campuses. And so that's why it's here. It's, it's, this is just extending the love and the opportunities and the relationships and conversations and really trying to put our, our time and our energy where our, where our mouth is. You know, not to say that we're about community, but really like, what does it look like? And so we're trying in many different ways to try to find how do we make these bridges and make them sustainable and consistent. I love this idea of bridge, the bridge between Credit Art Museum and Parkland. Um, and it's interesting because, like I said, I spent about an hour in the space, you know, sitting in the tables. I sat out in the cafe to kind of get a feel for how students were, you know, experiencing the art while they were studying together or having lunch. Um, I, I took out the cards, yes. race cards, and, you know, kind of figured out what I was going to do with my daughter when I ordered a set. <laughs> um, I really occupied the space, and but it's a different, it feels different. The space at, at um, Parkland feels different from the space at Cranon Art Museum. And so I'm wondering when you all are having these deliberations about what you wanted to do here, what 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 your vision was for the experience yeah. of visitors? So. Okay, and when I say we, I just want to make sure it's clear that it's it's me taking up that energy and taking responsibility for that. Like so, this wasn't necessarily on the. Uh, the planner or my other collaborators, Black on Black, who are very supportive and who are here today. But I, I want to make sure that I'm not implicating them. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't necessarily trying to recapture or or recreate that particular thing. It's a different site. It's a different yeah. place. It has different histories. Um, but 
I believe the show, while I'm very dedicated and excited about the show itself, to the point of your question, is about, for me, creating those opportunities, especially at the open, for people to come together. Okay. And that is something that, that can't be really seen as the show keeps going. You know, there were administrators and, and graduate students and undergraduate students from U of I that came here, which again in itself doesn't it's always happen. Right, it's a feat. It's a feat. Yes, it can be. Yeah. And um, and it inspired a few people, a few students who are here to go back and see that. And um, and so we're very thinking to do the door down to be about that lines of anything else. Yeah, how, yeah. just hopping on the bus is a, is, a, is a strong gesture, right? And so those are some of the types of things that I feel like were really central and important in creating that kind of uh, opportunity for, as I guess I mentioned, the bridge. Um, and, and, and as I, as I said, I want this to be consistent. And in my experience, um, it doesn't start from the top. It doesn't work from the top down. You know, it works from the, from the ground up. And so, just the, yes, professors and we are some who are here or are friends and our colleagues and respected, uh, respected artists. Um, that it's important that the students get invested mm -hmm. and students build, build the bridges and the organizations and the clubs and, and see the, the commonalities and, and, and the roots that they can connect through. And that's what's going to hopefully keep us together. Well, this is a bridge to my to my next content area. I have to say that there was a real kind of intimacy about the Parkland exhibition that, that is different from the Crane Art Museum exhibition. I felt a bit of warmness. I kind of felt kind of a kitchen. There's a kind of kitchen table vibe as I sat there kind of in the space. And it brings me to a question about Af Afrofuturism. Now, I don't want to I'm gonna reference my notes because I don't want to um misrepresent but the language in the exhibit is about um the work is is quote unquote afro futurist ethno gothic black quantum futurist um and it's some of the language you've used here but for me it a lot of nostalgia oh yeah so and, and so much so i mean in that i have a god brother you know we're, we're peers yes of a similar age the exhibit felt like his bedroom in the 80s, right? <laughs> Tony Birdsong. Yes. Comic yes. books, uh -huh. posters, mm -hmm. Rakim. Yes, Rakim. Um, Soul Train. Uh huh. Um, now song. his mama had the staples the, the and stuff in the living room. <laughs> but um, in vogue with a little bit of Phil Collins, kind of <laughs> in dialogue with the, you know, the kind of the black influence. On our British, you know, those waves of British artists who are coming here. So yes. it seems to me that whereas Afrofuturism is often cast as um, the African diaspora in dialogue with technology and science. Yes. But are you also saying that part of the work of Afrofuturism is also about making room for Black artists to explore both the Black past? Mm -hmm. and the black future yes so um, thank you for that question so in terms of afrofuturism some some artists uh especially one who's a former professor and community member here john bennings is one who is part of, of a of 50 percent of, of who coined the term ethnographic and i just want to start with that so afrofuturist does everything you say but what it doesn't give space for which ethnographic and horror does is for delving down into and then working, wrestling with some of the difficult subject matters that are happening, right? It's not just aspirational and forward thinking, it's you know, so for ethnographic can do that. But I want to give credit here to Nikita Thomas for framing this out for Black on Black on Black. This is something that really strongly I brought over, which is Black on Futurism. And that is, is kind of maybe give a shorter definition, is a strategy where a practice of three through collage, collage strategies, be able to bring together the, the, the future, the, pre, the imagined future, the present, and the past to talk more in a holistic way. And so, is that fair enough? Okay. okay. And so, so the, collage, the, 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 the soul train images mapped onto the cutouts, or the, those images being in dialogue with one another, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or, or the, all the works in the show in dialogue too, because. 
there's things that are happening that are after futurist in terms of facing for it. There are things that are uh, that are pointing to um, the contemporary and the present in terms of uh, King Otto's work, uh, which is also from the past too. It's the present's always moving, right? right. But um, and there's works that that propose, you know, uh, the past as you mentioned, where it's, it's whether it's smudgings or the uh, or the um, the works of Charles Edward Williams that's referencing Black Panthers, and, and so like it's, it's about it's about bringing together this collage and, and showing how we exist. In, in a quantum state that is 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 living it's not fixed it's not it's not this that and that but it's like it's all together it's multi-directional that's what saying right see saying um he oh, i said i was gonna double back to this yep. second okay. question um and and it is the question that i mean i noticed there was the the details of the Sister Staples um, work. But there is a, the majority of the artists, as I understand it, are male identified. Yep. And I'm wondering what that means, what that says about um, what kind of room exists for women in them and folks who identify as female yep. in this Afro futurist landscape in Champaign Urbana. Yep. Uh, there is room. There is room. Uh, but Here's where there's a fundamental structural issue. Okay. So for this exhibition, um, and Lisa and I have we went back and forth. There were many women who were invited, and I thought through and I found identified and invited. And the truth of the matter is, for many different reasons, uh, there's been fewer opportunities for Black women to occupy these spaces, whether they be drawing or futuristic things like that. And because of that they're having to do more of the labor of representing other places and so spread further and fit in you know and so sometimes it's not possible for them to be like i can do this over here i can do this over here and so some of them just couldn't participate in the show because they're doing the good work of being other places and that is just the pragmatic answer to to that particular question especially why there's so few in this show they're out there and they're doing the work well it's interesting because one of the things that came up with the allerton residency there were there were five or six of us who were residents, but and there was one individual who was another female artist who couldn't be in a residency, who couldn't spend the three weeks. Mm -hmm. She's an educator, she has a family. And so she came, did her work, and <laughs> did it. Go, yeah. And so again, I think this this helps us deal with the real barriers, right? The real dynamics on the ground yeah. in terms of understanding who gets to make art. Who gets to present it, produce it, who has the time and the privilege. Um, and so it's, it's I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. There's amazing people who we've been who we've invited. Uh Dorita Martin is amazing. She just represented America at the Week Biennial. She's a uh, alumni at Purdue. Went on uh, Stacey and I went out on a show, and Stacey's a good friend of hers, and we talked, and um she was able to do this. And actually Nikita can uh, as, as we tried to get her to come and be part of the black and black lecture series, and she didn't have time for that either. And so it's like there's that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure we speak about the reality. It's just like not that the effort is not there, not that it's not being done in the world. It's just like for this particular case, because there are systemic examples where women's efforts, labors are under-prioritized in the rule of men, black men. That's been a history that needs to be continually worked on. But in this particular example, I mean, in case it's really a, just a matter of practicality of and Revealing that real systemic deficiency and, and need. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've been having a conversation with Allerton and other concepts, like the New York residency, um, is trying to figure out how to construct shorter residencies or opportunities that are more conducive to folks who are who have those constraints but still want the opportunity to present work. Um, let me see. My final category. Zoom in through these. Um, the final category is well, it's about the specifics of your work, okay, of your project. Okay. In particular, I wanted to have a conversation about linen. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the project at Crane Art Museum and the project here, the use of linen and acrylic um, is something that is a through line between these pieces. And in my prep for this conversation, I've been thinking about linen. You know, so I've been Doing reading about linen, and there's a beautiful podcast called Immaterial. Well, if any of you are familiar with it, um, a beautiful podcast on different, um, on paper, on linen, 
on all kinds of um, material, art material. And one of the things that, that that episode talks about is the is the the politics of Lenin. Mm -hmm. Lenin being the the um, more the funeral regalia of the pharaohs. Mm -hmm. Lenin being the the fabric of choice. Mm -hmm among the colonial elites mm -hmm. in their conquest, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Um, but Lenin also being the fabric that was used for enslaved Africans in America, being a durable um, fabric that they could continue to labor for free um, while enslaved. So I wanted to have a conversation with you. It seems to me that there are no random choices. I, yes. So I wanted yes. to talk to you about how your use of linen in your work, particularly this work around these cutouts, yeah. and to have you talk a bit about the politics of choice yeah. and choice of materials yeah. and how that informed the work. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, this is, I'm so glad we're in Conversation Channel. I don't always get to, to use my term nerd out about these aspects, right? Like I do, I think about, to it too. I think about all these things all the time and, and you know, it's just, I hope that I layer in all and embed all these different ways of meaning. People that are curious to go find and dig down and sift through. And sometimes I can't get a chance to talk about things. So I appreciate this. Um, so it's a big. So first, the movement to abstraction or what seems seemingly abstract is relatively new to me. Um, and I wanted to think through those histories. And when you mentioned how Lenin is, it's everything you said. It's also, uh, in addition to being a privileged uh, material of the colonized, uh, colonizer, um, it's also retained, also retained that kind of elitism in painting history mm -hmm. as a preferred medium. Like you, you hear about canvas, but most of the painting you see, especially the ones in like, you know, major museums, all on linen. It's a more expensive material, it's a very durable material for all of your reasons, right? And so when I'm pointing to these American histories, especially Especially the, the, the adventures and murderers and everything, I'm also wanting to implicate the art world. I'm also wanting to implicate it in its perpetuation of violence and and in these histories and, and this, this collusion, right? And so, and I'm, I'm thinking about that in, in those two, these two different ways. First, on the canvas, the object that moves through the space and into collections, you know, and how it, it continues having meaning. Because of where it is, who has it, and who's looking at it, right? Who can consume it? Who can literally uh, collect it? Um, when you, I'm thinking about it pictorially, when you see the linen being exposed, how it points to that substrate, that history. It, it, it stays, it stays revealed. It's not can't be hidden. It can be covered. Um, and uh, and then I think about it secondly, which is something you didn't bring up, but is is important tandem, which is the wall. And so when I paint the silhouettes on the wall, if the, if the painting and the linen itself can't point back to the history, I want the wall and how these works and, and how the silhouettes engage with walls to, to implicate and point to the institutions. And then when those walls are painted over, no matter how well they sit they're sanded, that, that history stays. It stays in the walls, right? And so um, those are the things I'm thinking about with installation, with the material of linen, with the history where it points to, and how it can people might access those conversations. There's been amazing abstract, black abstract painters. Uh, one who's my mentor, uh, Deborah Dancy, um, is an amazing abstract painter. And a lot of black painters in the 60s and 70s moved to abstraction as a strategy when the uh, expectation of always representing, you know, visibly representing like blackness was. Uh, was sometimes uh, constraining. Um, but like the technology of, of, of painting of, in the European tradition, it wasn't made for us. We hacked into it, we figured it out, we have, have, have turned it into something that's useful for us. And the minute that we get there, uh, the, the institution of, of painting and art is like, okay, well, today, it's, everything's been done. Like, wait a second, <laughs> a lot of women and a lot of people of color have not had a chance at this material. Let's, let's talk about what else is possible because we are uh, weird using it, right? And so, um, but historically, uh, abstraction hasn't always been an easy tool to navigate the, 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 the kind of conversations that many Black people and Black communities want to have. Like the need to see and represent is important. 
And so, like, how do I embed that meaning and materiality when there's nothing visible there or the visibility of, of, of a black person isn't there? And so, thank you for asking that question. I think about like that lit in the material, the wall, the space, the context that it's in, and how, how the object of the painting moves through different spaces is all part of the context. Well, it's, it's, it, you mentioned it at the, the uh, opening of the Cryon Art Museum exhibition. Just briefly, the cat movie. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, it's you know, the back Look at Lennon and thinking about it and listening to the podcast. So um I knew that there were there were areas to be discussed more fully because I know all of these choices are intentional. Yeah. Which takes me to my next category of inquiry. Uh, let me ask my at least of here how are we doing on time? Are we we have time for one more question? So one more question. Okay, okay. one more question. Okay. That the final question, it, it dovetails really nicely um, with your last conversation about institutions. Mm -hmm. And clearly from the work that you're, you've done at Craner with collaborators, the work that's been done here at Parkland, there are many, many benefits to being a university-based installation artist. But I just wanted you to talk a little bit maybe about the challenges or the obstacles and also to ask if you believe that the work that you're doing out of traversing this city, the, the cities, um, will open up the doors for non-university based artists. Because my, my thinking about this work is often about, I mean, the fact that being university adjacent is, is a profound privilege. And so, how do we then? You talk about uh, Freeport, yeah. the ex, um, the Bipoc initiative. The work there is tremendous. So I'm wondering um, how that can get done locally as well. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, so, a question. No, no. And, and, and I don't. I'm not going to presume to be able to, to address that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big, a big, a big issue. Yeah. Um, oh, first and foremost, it's been highly important to me ever since the first day of being welcomed into Parkland's arms as well as the museum, I mean, the, the university, um, just because of employment, uh, from day one, you know, for 13 years, I felt like I've not been either or, um, and I've been really blessed to be not just um, in the university, but being in the community and the community adjacent to the works of a partner and, and you know, what, what she's doing in the community, you know, I, I've always felt embedded. Um, and and not not detached away. And so um being here, being present, being out, whether it's collaborating with Parkland with the University, with 40 North and 88 West is doing amazing work as well, and other uh organizations that are that are I see. I remember my first my first time here, my first year here, um an unfortunate death of, of Keewan Barrington. You know, I immediately participated in, in the exhibition as best I could. Uh, I seem to give respect and honor to this passing. And so, like, that's important to start. Um, and I, I say that to, to frame that I want to be cautious of, of what doors I'm, I'm addressing being open because I don't want to assume the university is the only way people. There are people doing amazing work in this community that don't need the university. And, but there is a real power to what the university and the metaphor of like a burner on an oven can do with, with support and funding and under under you that can Thanks. tell you to things exactly. And so there is a reality there, but I don't want to assume a hierarchy is like 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 this is uh, a, 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 a treasured way that that people need to go in order to get somewhere. But here, like there is, I just want to say that as a preface. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to ever get into answering that specific question of like how to how to do better, how to make more space, right? That was your answer. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, it's not your obligation alone. Yeah. But I, I mean, you know, I've been in artist community. I came here in 1989 yeah. as an undergrad, and you know, married well and stayed and got additional degrees. But I am trying to think, you named IMC and 40 North, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm really thinking about where the possibilities exist yeah. beyond, beyond you, the colleges and universities locally yes. for installation. Yeah. And, you know, particularly because 
you know, the daughter who's really creative and, you know, how do we foster a culture of installation among our young people, yeah. among people who are not affiliated with institution? Yeah. And just wondering, you know, just to think aloud about how it gets done. Yeah, I mean, those are good points. I know if you're- It's a thing to make art, right? right. But to kind of foster a culture of it yeah. among others. Yeah, Spanish Cultural Center. And, and there are programs that, that do help um, and why the wise men really are the, of this site and community space. You helped me with my list. A lot of, a lot of programming. Happening in summer, so anybody out in the state or anybody in that audience, yeah, but there is there is a need, a desperate need. Like we talk about food deserts, but there is a creative desert, you know, outside of the two campuses, and they're amazing spaces, with amazing opportunity. But I've had it at two campuses and, and the Springer Cultural Center and the Y, those are amazing spaces. They're like downtown Urbana, there's the Cinema Gallery down in downtown Champaign, there's very little, and I'm, th I'm thinking visual art, right? right. There's obviously right. music and art like that, but yeah. in terms of visual art, um, like yeah. a gallery space, a workspace where people from the community can come in and do and build together and make is needed. And so those are things that are definitely on my radar. I mean, I I don't know, if, you know, I have a bandwidth to do all that, but I do. I have talked to a few people in the community that are interested in investing, and I've been like, look, I might my ear and advice is here. Let's collaborate and talk. On the, on the campus side of things, um, trying to bring in more faculty of color is important. Yeah. So, the, so the labor can be shared, right? As you're right, it's maybe someone like, I, I can't do it alone, but trying to get into a position uh, where you have some ability, it's just being affiliated with the university is not enough. Like, how do you get to a certain place where you have the affluency within that system? We do some things now. I can hire people as chair of studio art, as Lisa mentioned twice. <laughs> you know, I can I can hire people and work to do that. I can um, mentor faculty. I can help create and nurture and foster and facilitate spaces for students um, to find each other, to build, to grow. And then uh, I'm seeing more and more the students, at least on at least on the university University of Illinois campus, are very interested and in, in, in excited. To get out into the community, like whether it's having classes out there or, or building up programming. Um, I know I was working with a graduate seminar this summer, and they were like, Can we go tour the IMC? Just bring it back to the IMC. Like, how can we do programming there? Like, how can we take what we're learning here and, and, and really work with people? And so, like, things are shifting. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a new conversation, new energy, and and at least in this case, it's not doesn't absolve us as as faculty and as as, as like you know uh, credential adults to um, to like say, well, let's just leave it on the young. We need to do it, and we need to nurture the energy that's coming from younger people that are interested in agent. So like, let's do this together. Like, let's make it happen. So I don't know that fully answers the question, but there are some things going on. There are some spaces. Thank you, Lisa, for this on how long yes. <laughs> there is a need. Well Lisa, I'm gonna yield because I know that there are questions in the room and I want to get some of them close attention. So yes. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.